So without uh, further ado, I'd like to introduce our featured presenters for this webinar. They are Anu Vedantam and Rosie Frasso. Anu organizes the Campus in Vivo User Group, facilitated by Penn Libraries, and Rosie guides cohorts of students in the Masters in Public Health program. Welcome. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you to Kevin for the opportunity to share some of our experiences here at the University of Pennsylvania. We're excited to be able to talk with you. We're going to talk about the general topic of connecting librarians to researchers, and then we're going to take a focus on one class that uses in vivo to create a student research exhibit that is hosted by Penn Libraries. So the library plays a role in several different ways. In the process, we hope to share with you some of the highs and the lows of providing support and ideas for in vivo users on our campus. I'm Anu Vedantam, and I direct the Weigel Information Commons at Penn Libraries. This is a high-tech, high-touch space in the center of campus on the first floor of our main library building. We're well known as a place that helps faculty and students with a variety of technology support needs. My co-presenter today is Rosie Frasso, the Director of Education for the Master's in Public Health program. Rosie actually teaches right here in the library many semesters, down the hall from the Information Commons in our new collaborative classroom. And the library hosts an annual exhibit of her students' research results. Let me start with our agenda. One second. So we're going to talk first about the in vivo user group that is hosted and organized by Penn Libraries with significant assistance from some several research centers around campus. Then, and I'll, I'll be handling that piece, Rosie will take us um, kind of through a detailed tour of these qualitative research student exhibits that we host um, in the library that her students have created for her classes. And then I'm going to wind up with a short summary of how you can take the ideas that we're sharing with you today and translate them to your campuses. We do have a poll so we can learn a little bit more about how our campuses may be similar or different from, from what you see. If we have time after the Q&A, we have some interesting extensions uh, of the work that we're going to share with you today. So that's our general agenda, and we're going to go ahead and launch into it now. I thought it's important to start with a little bit of context about the University of Pennsylvania. This is a nice photograph of our campus. We're a large Ivy League university in an urban campus in West Philadelphia. Drexel University is next door, and there are several other universities in the city, and our user group has attracted interest from um, more than just Penn folks. Penn itself has 12 schools, of which four include undergraduate students, and the rest are graduate schools. Last fall, we enrolled 10,400 undergraduates and a slightly higher number of graduate students. About half of our operations involve the health sciences. There are a number of hospitals and medical research initiatives, um, some of which really depend on in vivo. I wanted to mention our responsibility-centered budget setup, which allows each school or center to make software and infrastructure decisions with substantial independence. And there are multiple IT organizations. In terms of in vivo, Simply getting a count of the number of licenses used by Penn was not a simple task at all. We encountered many surprises just trying to figure out who is using it at Penn. Research is a core activity at Penn, and undergraduates start research soon after new student orientation. So the term researcher, our title today was connecting librarians with researchers. Researchers at Penn can mean anyone from a first-year student to a librarian, to a surgeon, to a law school professor. And I think you will get a sense of the variety of our constituents over the next uh, hour. Even the library itself is plural. So um, Penn Libraries includes a large number of libraries and spaces, and a lot of our work with the user group is simply connecting within the library system. 
So I manage the Weigel Information Commons, which is known as a crossroads on campus. And we're kind of well known for expertise in software instruction and support, as well as general academic support services. We have partnerships with our writing center, our public speaking center, and our academic skills support center. So starting an in vivo user group kind of builds on some work that has been longstanding. So our in vivo user group brings together researchers from many parts of Penn. There are four of us that are the key organizers, and on your screen is a link to the website where you can learn more about our user group. I'm going to go ahead and type this into the chat window also, so that, um, actually I don't see a way to share it. Maybe um, Kevin can help me move this over into the chat window. Sure. This is the link. Um, okay. This link will take you to the online presence for our user group. So our four key organizers are Ebony Easley and Lisa Jacobs, who worked at the Mixed Methods Lab. Katie Kellum, who works at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia's Policy Lab, and myself. And on the slide, you also see a photo of Rosie's class, which we're going to focus on in a few minutes. The user group started last summer, so I would like to quickly describe how we got here, and then describe how we run the user group itself. So a little bit about the history of training. A few years ago, we began hearing about many small efforts to use in vivo around campus. Researchers needed access to the software, and the librarians did not yet have expertise or licenses for the software. So the two links on the screen will take you to a list of our technology workshops and our tutorials. We provide training on a regular basis on things like Excel and PowerPoint and Word and commonly used software. In vivo, though, is kind of in a different category. So it, I actually had to um, campaign extensively, let me go back when I skipped over a slide, with our IT department to make arrangements so that InVivo would be installed on every library PC over the summer. InVivo was basically added to the basic image for our PCs. This meant that we could advertise that any library PC provides InVivo, and that single statement that it was in every library on every PC made a huge difference. We used a key server technology, so the total number of concurrent licenses initially was only two, which is not a big commitment of cost, but the process of making it systematic made a huge impact to our support for InVivo. So the ability to say to researchers around campus, InVivo is available to you on every library PC was huge. It made publicity and outreach much simpler. We also contacted InVivo and received special dispensation by IP address for our training lab. So up to 16 people at a time could receive training on InVivo in the computer lab that's part of the Information Commons. So these two steps, a commitment to licenses on every PC and an arrangement for our training space were essential precursors to our InVivo user group. During this stage, we had to negotiate differences between PC and Mac, differences across versions, desktop versus laptop, and then manage expectations. So one example of how this played out. I distinctly remember a conversation with our writing center where researchers were just beginning to understand what in vivo was. I was able to arrange for a short-term loan of a library laptop that had in vivo installed on it to the writing center researchers, and that helped them get started on a large ethnographic study. Later, that short-term loan led to a series of workshops and consultations where writing instructors came to the library to learn how to use in vivo. Eventually, they used in vivo to annotate videos of their freshman seminars to capture best practices in facilitation. So a project that ended up as a multi-year project started with a single laptop loan. So this issue of infrastructure with in vivo, I feel, is, is pretty essential. 
So the, able, the ability to handle multiple platforms and to lend laptops with a license helps position the library as a helper and as a flexible partner. We did have to manage expectations and track usage, and initially our own knowledge of InVivo was a limiting factor, which brings me to the history of training. And I'd like to talk briefly about staff expertise. So buying InVivo licenses, putting it on the image and putting it on every PC, ensuring that the software loads properly and that the sample project works is, was itself a big accomplishment. But once we surmounted that challenge, it was a necessary condition for our user group, but it wasn't sufficient. And we'll welcome you to browse our website, commons.library.upenn.edu. You'll see we offer workshops on a range of topics. Our monthly calendar is really popular, and we bring in a large number of guest presenters. Initially, we had Envivo, but all of us were incredibly nervous to actually touch it. So connecting with campus experts, such as Rosie, was essential. I actually remember the feeling in the pit of my stomach when a professor would walk in and say, oh, so I hear you know in vivo. Like the performance anxiety was pretty intense. What I learned to do was to hem and haw and write down the question very carefully, then call my colleagues at the Mixed Methods Lab and beg for help. So I became expert at carrying questions from one person to another, learning a little bit each time. Eventually, we actually contacted a campus expert who came to the library once a month to teach in vivo basics. And every month, that workshop would be full. There would be a waiting list. So this process of developing library expertise, it really does continue. Even now, many librarians have come to my in vivo basics workshops, which I now teach every month, the same workshop again and again, but they don't yet feel confident to teach this particular topic. Which brings me to this idea of the roles of librarians. I have emphasized to my colleagues that they can help faculty and researchers choose what tool to use when without knowing exactly how the tool works. So having librarians see examples of in vivo doing powerful things, word clouds, graphs, mind maps, it's as important, if not more important, than teaching librarians to actually do coding and analysis. So the last item on this slide, blog posts that feature special projects, is a great way to grab librarian attention and make in vivo seem a little bit more approachable. So. A little bit about our challenges, um, you can see that the challenges of the learning curve, the unfamiliar interface, the platform and version conversion issues, these are all the reasons why in vivo can be sometimes quite intimidating. Addressing these issues right at the beginning of a workshop and at the beginning of the user group meetings makes it much easier for people to take this on. They already know the difficulties they're going to face. Similarly, celebrating the joys is, ex is exceedingly important. What we try to emphasize in the, both the user group and the workshops is the power that InVivo has to show you the visualizations, the fact that many researchers can use InVivo on the same data, and the way that you can use the tools for so many different purposes is something we try to emphasize. So just contrasting the challenges and the joys is a great way to bring librarians in as well as make it easier for researchers to see how the software might be useful to them. So this is how our user group functions. Basically we meet once a month. Um, a different person facilitates each month. That person gets to start us off with an advanced topic. The point of the user group is to make the learning transparent. In the picture, you see um, people meeting in our collaborative classroom, and you'll see Rosie's use of that in a little bit as well. A key aspect of the user group is that individuals get to show off their projects. They get to open up their databases and show it to the group. They are talking about their research and how InVivo fits into it, and people translate it to their own context. The focus is on getting local ideas to be visible and to start to have conversations that are very discipline specific, which is something that is much harder to do in a workshop setting. 
So in just to you know, talk briefly, the in vivo basics workshops, they're scripted and systematic. We use the sample project, we make a query, we add codes, etc. The user groups are not. They have a lot of time for networking, for introductions, some snacks, some lighthearted topics. For example, right before Thanksgiving, Lisa Jacobs did a coding exercise where we took our Thanksgiving meal plans and we actually coded recipes and that was really popular. Our local listserv is a place where researchers can ask specific questions. And um, we have a Canvas course just for the user group where researchers can post their project files without having to worry about um, privacy and ask questions in a more confidential way. Uh, and one thing we're moving to, which is really interesting, is we're getting a lot more requests now for appointment-based assistance with in vivo, and maybe we can talk about that during the Q&A. Just to, com uh, to conclude this first part of our presentation, I'd like to talk about this idea that multiple voices help. The main advantage of having a user group that is structured in the way that we do is you're moving from a workshop instruction model to a networking model where the library becomes a place where people connect to other people around campus. We use lightning rounds a lot. This is a picture of the gong that we use. And what a lightning round is, is that people will stand up and they talk about their particular use of in vivo or some other tool. They have exactly three minutes to talk and then somebody hits the gong. It's a great way to quickly share ideas. The person presenting doesn't have to prepare a long talk, so it's actually easy to get senior researchers to come and talk about their work. It also provides a way to share examples that are very discipline specific and project type specific. So if I'm using in vivo with the 10-person research group, I might be able to learn from somebody else who has a multi-person research group and look at how they use in vivo. What we've learned through the lightning round and through the user group meetings is that the workflow issues are often central. The software itself is really just a small piece of the puzzle. And the lightning round presentations and the user group conversations help reveal these workflows and just make things a little bit more transparent. So we're going to switch um, now. I'm going to hand my um, uh, the the baton over to Rosie, who's going to be talking about a specific example of in vivo in the classroom. Rosie, please go ahead. Thank you, Anu. I'm excited to get a chance to talk to you all today and tell you a little bit about how we've incorporated this tool in a class I teach at the University of Pennsylvania. And we couldn't do this without the support and um, excitement around this product in the library because there are definitely go-to folks when it comes to using the space and using the uh, software in that setting. So I teach a course on qualitative methods every year for social work and public health students and we use different qualitative approaches to organize the class. So the first thing we do each semester is decide what we want to study as a group. And we do this through um, employing a nominal group technique. And if you're not familiar with that approach, I'd encourage you to think about it and look it up. And it's really a great way to get to consensus and uh, set priorities and an agenda. Then we do something called free listing. And each student in the class, and there's usually about 25 or 30 students, does five intercept interviews with other members of the Penn community to help us understand a little bit more about the topic that we've decided to study. Then together we decide to do photo elicitation interviews. And again, each student in the class does one of these interviews all around the same topic. So instead of going off and doing independent and individual research projects, we work as a team to create a project that has some legs. And we use in vivo to analyze the data that everyone collects in this one sort of culminating experience of creating an understanding around a topic and sharing and disseminating findings based on our analysis through in vivo. We do exhibits and blogs and publications related to this. Oh, it's not letting me advance. Up oh, here we go. Um, so this quickly just sort of shows you how the nominal group approach works. Um, uh, each student makes a list of all the things they're interested, 
all the things they're interested in end up up on the board and we have this wonderful space in the library that's sort of a 360 circle that allows us to write all over the walls and think about the space in a very creative way <clears throat> and then we go through a few steps of analysis that allows us to come up with a final topic and I'm going to talk to you about a project we did uh, focusing on fear and safety among students on campus. So free listing is another anthropological technique that can quickly help us get a better understanding of a phenomena. So each student runs out and interviews five other students that they, uh, that they touch base with someplace on campus to get a sense of what this phenomena means. So they just ask them basically to give a list of words that come to mind when they think about fear and safety. And we use another software package called Anthropack to analyze that list. And the way it allows us to do this is uh, it calculates a salience. So it not only looks at the words that come up most frequently across all participants, but it allows us to look at the, the rank that each participant gives that word. So it calculates salience based on the frequency that a word appears and how, how high on someone's list it appears. And we're able to get an understanding of what are the things that, re that really are related to fear and um, safety on campus. And then we move on to photo elicitation. And if you're not familiar with this approach, it's simply using an, an image as part of an interview. So what each student in the class does is they identify someone else on campus to, um, to be part of the study. And they ask them to think about the topic. And again, the example this, this year that I'm speaking of was fear and safety. And to take a picture whenever something reminds them of that topic and to do that over the course of a week and to come back and do an interview. So because many students and even many of us in, in uh, out of side of college are walking around with pretty sophisticated cameras on our cell phones these days, it's really easy to do this work. But it can be done with pre-existing images from the newspaper, the internet, Facebook, cartoons, family photos. But we ask people to take new pictures. So this is an example of some of the pictures that have been come up when we've done these interviews. People, students and participants have brought these pictures back and they're used to guide the interview. The student researcher would say, tell me what's going on in this picture. Tell me why you chose it. Why did it remind you of fear or safety? And, and here's an example of someone who shared a picture of a clock and it says quite simply, this clock ran out of battery the second month of school and I just haven't had time to change it. You always feel like you're going to run out of time. So the picture is a very interesting tool. It allows you to engage in conversation. It allows the participant to think about the subject way ahead of time. And then when you go to disseminate your findings, you have this image that actually amplifies the voice in a way that's very effective and engaging. <clears throat> so just to go back over the steps, each student would do this interview, a free list interview, which follows the pattern of a traditional interview except the focus is on the pictures. And then we would record those interviews. Each student transcribes their own interview and then as a team we create a code book and analyze these interviews using in vivo. We have our, an empty database that we would create and start from scratch to build to build the database for this analysis. And this is just a snapshot of sort of what in vivo looks like, but it's stripped down and we haven't done anything yet. And here's a picture of the database that we were using to analyze the fear and safety data from the class we did in, in, uh, in 2015. So you can see that all the nodes here are listed and this is an example of one transcript and you can see where some coding has been done and each student's transcript is embedded into the database and now it becomes a project that is worthy of publication and attention because they've combined all their efforts together to shed light on one phenomena instead of 30 students going off and doing individual work. Once we've done that first phase of analysis, we kind of bring it back away from the technology for a minute. We've decided on what our codes will be, and then we've decided and organized those codes into sort of thematic categories. And here you see students taking pictures that they've used during the interview and some of the quotes that were with those pictures and organizing them into what will soon turn into be our exhibit. 
And this is a picture of what our final exhibit looks like with the preliminary analysis of all the transcripts of all the students' work together. So each student from this point gets to choose one picture and one passage to share that was coded into the categories that we created together as a class. And this is sort of our class at the end. And I think what's exciting about this approach is students learn how to employ qualitative technology qualitative data collection approaches. They become familiar with the technology in vivo that allows you to deal with a lot of data efficiently. And then they get to have to see the product, to be part of an exhibit, to get a lot of actually a lot of attention on campus around the work they do because the library so graciously hosts our work and people are able to come and comment and visit their, their work to get a better understanding of what it is they did, learned, and understood. And this is just a pic some pictures of the exhibit close up so that it walks you through the process of how we do the analysis and how we make decisions. And you can study it a little more closely when you have the slides after the um, webinar. And again, these are some of the thematic categories that we organized our data into. We did this using in vivo, but here we share it in this poster format so that we could disseminate it effectively. So the benefits of photo elicitation is that you ask the subject to think about a pro an issue or a topic way before you have the interview. So they're kind of primed to think about it. They're primed to talk about it. And they're taking pictures as they process the thoughts around it. It ends up improving the rapport between the participant and the uh, interviewer because you have this picture to focus on and it allows you to kind of create a natural conversation more efficiently than when you're doing interviews that don't employ photographs. I mean, I do have to say this is not the right approach for every phenomenon or every question, um, but when it is appropriate, it's actually very, very um, much enhancing our ability to connect with participants. And then when it comes to dissemination, you have the pictures and the quotes to share. And you'll see this work published very, I think, effectively in the literature and really allows people to engage with the participant experience by seeing both the image and the photograph. Now you can, um, and the quote, you can code the images. We don't do that in this class. There are other projects that are designed to treat the photos as data. In this example, the photos are really an elicitation tool to make the conversation rich and exciting and to aid in dissemination. But they could be treated as data if the project was organized a different way. And in vivo readily allows you to code images. <clears throat> there are certainly some challenges with doing a class this way. Because we're doing a real live research project, we need real live approval from the IRB. And every institution's approach to this is different. Because I don't know what the topic is going to be till the first day of class, I can't do this ahead of time. I need to wait and see what the students choose to study as a group and then get through the IRB process pretty quickly so that we can do this work together. Um, so there's definitely challenges, and these really vary based on your data um, collection approach, the institution um, climate around IRB, and you have to think about all the players if you're doing stuff at the city level with schools, hospitals, universities. So you need to know that system. If you're thinking about employing this in a course, you'd want to have a conversation with your IRB ahead of time to know how quickly they could turn it around so that you could rule this you know, roll through this in the course of a semester. And I would say you need a very supportive uh, uh, team. And I think the library has provided that support for us by making in vivo accessible to all the students, by providing some training for the students, and a lab where we can do this work collaboratively. <clears throat> There's some logistics for sure. You need time. Um, you need the space to share an exhibit. You need the skills to gather the data and code it effectively. You need people who are willing to partake in the study. You may need to provide them some incentives to do so. You need access to the software. I mean, certainly you can do these analyses without software, but I would never recommend it and I would never want to go back to those days because you're not really able to manage the volume of data um, in any effective way in the absence of software. You need the skills to do the analysis, and then you need to make some clear decisions about dissemination. And again, all that takes time. <clears throat> this slide kind of goes uh, through how we manage the data and analysis phase. So the first step, and this could be an entire talk itself, 
but I just like to have it in one place so I can w quickly walk through it with folks. So once the students have done the interviews and they've collected the data and transcribed them, we have to get to know it, read through them, get a sense of what's going on. Then a couple of people on the team, and when I do this in class, we all do this together, which is kind of cumbersome, read a sample of the transcripts and begin to create a code book. And then we draft that preliminary code book, review it with the team, or there's a, a, a principal investigator to make sure that we have everything that we need in place to organize these data and understand them. And we build that code book into the InVivo database. And then we code that code book, we code the data using that code book, and then double check the code book after a couple of transcripts have been coded to make sure people are understanding the operational definitions that are embedded in the code book. We have coders meet regularly to do intercoder reliability, to make sure they're on the same page, to make sure the code, back, code book is working, and we adjust it as needed. And we update the code book a couple of times during the process just to make sure that it is something that you can um, appreciate and understand and the operational definitions are well flushed out so that someone could come along and code these data if you were to win the lottery and not able to finish the project. And the codebook should really be able to live on its own as a clear guide to understanding how the data were organized. It's where you kind of document your capacity to keep your biases at check by having these operational definitions. And then we organize the codes into themes. And that's the step you saw the students doing in class. So translating this to your campus, you really are going to need to understand what that climate is how efficient your IRB would be, how um, likely you are to be able to get participants to engage with your students, and how excited you can get your students about doing a project that, that yields an exhibit that they can all share in and be proud of. I think there's no, uh, no setting where this wouldn't work, but it certainly is a different level of uh, time commitment based on some of the, the settings that you're at. And it might be, you know, the first time you do it, more challenging than when you do it later on. Um, I'm going to pass this back to Anu to talk a little bit about the blog. Sure. So thank you so much, Rosie. Um, I think every time you talk to me about your project, I learn new parts of it. Um, I think the, the last slide you showed with the boxes is, is really helpful. Um, and it started me thinking about one point I'd like to make. So this last section of our webinar is about um, translating some of these ideas to your campuses. And we do have a poll for you right after this section. I'm just going to go through two quick slides before we um, open up the poll. One thing I wanted to mention that builds on Rosie's slide here, um, you could take this slide that Rosie is using with her students, and you could use the very same slide for an advanced research project. Some of these concepts are the same, whether they're done by undergrads or they're done by um, a whole research team. And part of what um, you might want to think through is on your campus, how do you connect your beginner in vivo users or even the people who've never touched in vivo but you think would benefit from it to the people who use in vivo every day who are past the learning curve. And one way in which we have been able to do this here at Penn is using our blog and our annual symposium, which is called the Engaging Students Through Technology Symposium. Rosie presented at this symposium a couple of years ago. And uh, you can see the video of um, her work on our website. I'm going to start with our blog. Um, this is an infographic of our blog and at the bottom of the screen is the address to explore our blog. It's penwick.wordpress.com. If you go to our blog on the top right is a search box. If you put in Rosie's last name, Frasso, um, you will be able to directly see the blog posts that relate to the different exhibits that her students have made. As she mentioned, each of these exhibits is hosted in the main library on the first floor right when our visitors walk in. And typically our exhibits um, 
Rosie's students work is up there for several months. So the new students, when they visit our campus, they see it. Um, you know, the general public sees it. It gets a really wide audience. And the topics her students have chosen, whether it's fear and safety or their current topic is technology use. Uh, I know they did one on pressure. Our general interest topics. So it helps take something arcane and make it accessible to the general public. One thing we've learned through our blog is that when we have other people write for our blog, which is non-library people, or we write about non-library people, that always brings us much more attention than we are, when we are inward focused. So our most popular posts that you can see on the graphic were all written by students. Uh, Kelly Liu is an undergraduate student. We have undergraduate students who write for our blog. We have graduate students. We have faculty. We have guest people writing for our blog. And whenever something like this exhibit comes, we always chronicle the exhibit on our blog and we connect it to the user group, to the tutorials we have on NVivo. So if somebody sees the end results and wants to replicate it, they can see the connections between the exhibit and the software that kind of led to the exhibit. Uh, the main thing I want to mention with this idea, both of the blog and of our annual symposium, is how can you celebrate local successes? Because there's something powerful about knowing that somebody in your department has done something really cool, or somebody just across um, in the building next to you is doing something, and it connects within the campus. And the blog and the symposium are two ways uh, that our library has found to kind of connect researchers within campus. Moving on to your thoughts on your campus, I'm going to pose four, five questions for you to think about is, as you look at your campus, where are the hubs? Where are the places on your campus where people naturally show up? It probably involves food. It may involve a well-structured, well-lit learning space. It may be in the library. It may be in a coffee house on campus. But if you talk with your researchers and get a sense of what are the places on campus where they congregate on their own, and then a little bit about what inspires people to come together. This April, we're doing another lightning round, and I've been very happy that whenever I write to somebody and say, oh, will you speak at the lightning round, the answer is, yeah, sure, because it has a, a habit of bringing people together. And this idea of sharing your spotlight so that the library, in some ways, um, has a rare opportunity to create a spotlight on campus, and when that library can shine that spotlight around and focus on different research groups each month at the user group, it's a powerful way of making the point that all of us are learning in vivo, and we can learn a lot from just looking at how another person views a complex software such as this. The fourth question is worth spending a little bit of time on, which is the librarians and how they take on a complex software such as NVivo. The comments I've heard from our librarians is that it's hard to learn a software program like NVivo just to learn it. It's much easier to learn NVivo in the context of a research project that is meaningful. One way in which we have addressed this is uh, the library conducts surveys pretty often. Most recently, we did a student survey back in October for our annual symposium. We were very fortunate. We had 940 students take the survey, which gave us a large data set that is mostly textual in nature and works really well for an excuse to actually use in vivo. Um, not all of us have jobs where conducting research is a daily activity, so coming up with a way to find projects where in vivo can be used in a real context, I think makes it much easier for librarians to just practice. So opening up a data set um, and actually doing some coding, actually doing some analysis, it really builds confidence, I think, for library staff. Over time, we've gotten to uh, a point where I think NVivo is really well known within our library. People know that it's popular and they know who is using it on campus, which is part of the, the goal of the user group. And the last topic kind of fills in with the same idea. How can you help librarians to learn NVivo? So to just think 
through processes that are in place on your campus that make it easier for your librarians to approach a complex piece of software such as in vivo, knowing what it could do, knowing what it does do on your campus, knowing a little bit maybe about what it does at other campuses that could be translated, um, and then also having a support structure with external experts. So the fact that we have people on our user group from research groups around campus is, is a huge help because the library doesn't use in vivo with video and audio and some of the other ways in which you can use it. So having the ability to have a small community that the user group creates makes a big difference when you get a question um, that is hard to answer or unusual in some way. I know lately we're getting a large number of questions about how to mine Twitter data and it isn't something that um, we, we do every day so this is a perfect example of having to reach out, go beyond the library to find a researcher who is working on something like this and then bring that information back to the library. So I think we have um, covered most of our slides. We'd like to stop at this point. Um, this is our contact information. I'm going to go ahead and ask Kevin to please open up the poll and we would love your questions at this point and then we will also, um, if we have time, we'll talk a little bit about some extensions of the work we've shared. Kevin, I'm going to hand this over back to you. Thank you, Anu. Thank you, Rosie. Um, just as uh, Anu mentioned, if you happen to have any questions or anything, feel free to uh, send them our way through your question panel. And just as a reminder, um, everyone who registered for the webinar will certainly receive a follow-up email, and within that email will include a, a link to the recording and to the slides. Um, so again, feel free to send in any questions that uh, you might have. Kevin, I'm going to put our blog address in the chat window. If you wouldn't mind um, resharing that with the audience, um, that will take them to the success stories, including the posts about Rosie's exhibits. No problem. I've, our, I've just done it. All right. Um, it looks like um, no questions to this point. <clears throat> Do we have time then to talk about um, some of the extensions of this uh, of this work? I'm sure if you'd like to, that would be great. Great, Rosie. I'll hand it over back to you to talk a little bit about the the slides you have at the end of the deck. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so I wanted to tell you a little bit about a project I've been working on with a colleague named Willie Burnett, who's a art professor um, at a university in Austin, Texas. And just when you think there are no more uses for in vivo, you find yet another. Uh, so Willie Burnett has been traveling the U.S. for about 20 years, collecting signs from homeless people. Uh, he gives them some money in exchange for their signs, and he builds these art exhibits to help shed light on the lived experience of those struggling with housing. I heard Willie speaking on National Public Radio about his work, and I called him up. I wrote him an email. I looked him up. I called him up. And I said, you know, this is really interesting. You have all these signs. And on these signs are really bits and pieces of stories that folks have been telling you for years. Might you consider collaborating on a project where we could take the language and the words and the messages in these signs and then use in vivo uh, software to analyze the content of these signs and create sort of a better understanding of what this experience is like. And he had sort of anecdotally organized the signs in a way that really um, it helped him sort of organize his art exhibit, but he had never really thought about the signs as being qualitative data and really worthy of analysis. So he was very excited and willing to collaborate. So he shared the signs with us that he collected over a summer trip. In the summer of 2014, he visited 24 cities, and he had collected those signs 
for his art project entitled We Are All Homeless. And you can look that up and visit his website. Really interesting work. So all 292 signs that he collected in that summer had been photographed. And we took the text from the photograph and transcribed it verbatim. And using Invivo 10, we conducted a secondary qualitative thematic analysis of the signs. All the signs, all the signs were uh, transcribed, ed, entered into Invivo, and we double-coded everything and organized it into thematic categories. So this is an example of some of his signs. And I think this work really uh, sort of sheds light on this opportunity to think about huge volumes of data and then your ability to organize them and understand them with this software. And had, you know, in the absence of software, this would have been a pretty um, onerous undertaking. And I'm not sure that I would have been willing or excited to try to take it on. So we started with this 222 signs, but he has thousands. And we're considering um, adding, you know, adding to the database uh, some of the content from the additional signs. So doing this in a way that allows us to appreciate patterns and organize these signs in a way that help us understand the literature. So what we did after we created a code book and coded the content is we linked the different thematic categories to bodies of literature that explain and describe the homeless experience so that we have now linked to these articles sort of the, the participants or the community perspective of the, you know, the lived experience of folks struggling with housing. So it's an exciting way to think about how this software can allow you to engage with what are just really artifacts of society and treat them as data. So I guess, I mean, Rosie, I think I would want to mention something to build on that a little bit. I think mm -hmm. one of the really helpful aspects of having, you know, this kind of exhibit in the library, the user group, is that the library is, I think, more aware now of the variety of research projects actually happening on mm -hmm. campus. Um, so as you know, people come to us and they kind of show off their research project, it actually provides librarians with much deeper insight into the type of questions that you are asking as a professor on campus, which if I, you know, did not interact with you through the concept of supporting the software use, it may never have come up in casual conversation. Um, you know, for example, I think one of the things um, I've been really surprised about is what is considered raw material for research, right? Raw material is, comes in so many different forms, um, and, and the ways in which people collect data has so much more variety now um, compared to maybe, say, 10 years ago when it was all interviews or questionnaires. Would that, I mean, do you see in vivo as making it easier for you to work with data that is just hard to put into a box? Oh, absolutely. And I'm working actually on two projects that I think use unique sources of data. So one is we're evaluating the impact of an app that's used in the hospital to um, further communication or improve communication between nurses and physicians. Um, so it's a texting app. And they rolled it out in the ICU, and they wanted to know how it was impacting um, patient care and how it was impacting the turnaround time for orders to be registered and responded to, and if it impacted sort of the discharge experience for patients. So we've taken many, many, many text messages, I think many thousands. We had a year's worth of text messaging data. And we sampled uh, that data trying to make up some random weeks. So we took several Mondays, several Tuesdays, several Wednesdays. Uh, we couldn't possibly code it all, but we coded about 20% of a year's worth of messages by randomly selecting days of the week. And using Invivo, we were able to organize these data uh, to allow us to see how the, how the text app is being used. So it was designed to be used one way, so we're confirming that the, the mission is sort of 
working in real time, but also seeing what other things folks are doing with it. Now, we could ask people what they're doing with the app, but, you know, our recollection of those activities is very different than what they really look like. And having, having these text messages and software that can manage this volume of data really allows us to do something quite different and really, I think, exciting and interesting. The other yeah, thing I'm true. working on, oh, sorry, Anna. No, go ahead. And the other project I'm working on is with a group of folks at the Children's Hospital who are working with children who are preparing to um, undergo bariatric surgery. And they are part of a community group, um, sort of a, a social network and online community that provides support to one another as part of an intervention. But in any event, they have partaken in Facebook um, activities around this. And we're coding and, um, pro and coding and using Inviva to code uh, a series of um, Facebook posts over the course of six months mm -hmm. where, where the um, potential patients were engaging with the support group online. And again, easy to extract these data from uh, Facebook, easy to embed them in Invivo, and pretty easy to manage the analysis and query it. I mean, I think that's the thing that Invivo does that we didn't quite mention is we can query these data in a way that we can't do, you couldn't do if you were doing it by hand. So it really allows for that rich, um, flexible approach to considering what is data and what, what can data look like and how are these data allowing us to get better understandings of experiences or phenomena or challenges or life events. So um, I'll put our contact information up. I know we don't have too much time left. I'm going to welcome everyone to just check out the website. Um, you will see handouts there of everything that's been presented at our user group. And hopefully you can contact um, Rosie and I with any questions that come up.